You are listening to Making It in the Toy Industry, episode number 235. Welcome to Making It in the Toy Industry, a podcast for inventors, entrepreneurs, and makers like you. And now, your host, Ajel Wade. Hey there, toy people. Ajel Wade here, and welcome back to another episode of Making It in the Toy Industry. This is a weekly podcast brought to you by the Toy.com. My guest today is ex-boss babe Tarzan K. She's a writer of Emails But Better, a much-loved newsletter that is fun to read and more addictive than whatever you're watching on Netflix right now. Her programs teach business owners like me how to write highly readable, story-driven emails that sell using consent-based strategies to grow and sell with email. Tarzan has spent years quietly dismantling her seven-figure boss babe empire and building a more inclusive online business that prioritizes people over profits. She lives in Ontario, Canada with her two children and one canoe. I'm thrilled to welcome Tarzan on the show. So happy to have you here, Tarzan. Thanks for having me, Michelle. <laughs> I feel like you just saw a different side of me or something. I definitely did. I was like, oh, this is different from the person that I had brunch with last yeah. week. This is my radio voice. <laughs> Sometimes my husband in conversations will be like, why are you using your toy coach voice on me right now? I'm so happy that you're joining us on the show today. And, and for those listening, I want to preface why I wanted to invite an email expert on the show where normally we just talk about how to make toys, how to sell toys. And that's because email is a huge part of my business. And I've been getting a lot of emails from toy brands. I told Tarzan in one of our group coaching calls, a program that she runs that I'm a part of, I said, there, there's a big misunderstanding about consent. And I'd love to talk more about this. And Tarzan said, maybe I can come on your podcast. A lot, a lot of people know, oh yeah, email. I'm supposed to do email. Like email is the way people sell things, but um, they just have a real lot of resistance around sending it because of the exact problem that you just alluded to. There's like we all have so much in our, our inboxes that we're like, it's not just the toy industry. We all get this stuff every single day that we're like, I did I sign up for this? Didn't I unsubscribe from this? Who is this person? And it means that a lot of people just don't send email because they don't want to be one of those annoying people in the inbox. And what I teach is how to do email marketing in a way that feels really good, like marketing that you feel good about. And the way that I teach people how to do that is by using consent. Mm -hmm. And at the most basic level, it's just only emailing people who actually said yes to getting emails from you. And a lot of people have the, even those emails and they still don't email them. But if you don't have those emails, that's step one is like finding, uh, you know, building sort of a home base for people to say yes to your newsletter and all of the other places that you collect emails, like maybe it's at trade shows, just a simple tick box. Yes, I would like to get emails from you. Before we get deeper, there is one question I ask people that join this podcast. And that question is normally the thing that surprised me most about the toy industry was. But for you, I would love to ask you to finish this sentence. The thing that surprised me most about the email marketing industry was. Oh, interesting. I guess... The thing that surprised me the most about email marketing is how intimate the connections with subscribers can be. Like the whole purpose of email is that it's this huge platform and it's for reaching people at scale. However, especially for those of us who are very mission driven, the inbox is, it's actually not a one to many conversation like social media. It's actually one person reading your email in their inbox. Like I always use you language. I'm talking to you rather than all of you subscribers. Mm -hmm. There is a certain level of intimacy. And especially for me, because I share a lot of stories, I'm a personal brand and I share a lot of the ups and downs of business. I teach through story and like stories are just a great way of connecting with people and yes, it's quite surprising how intimate those connections can be and feel. That's how we quote unquote met. I joined your program and that's mm. when I first really got to meet you. But from my perspective, meeting Tarzan was through emails, was through your emails and understanding your story and learning about you. So 
Going back Mm -hmm. to the conversation of consent, ticking a box to say, yes, I'm interested in receiving your email. Why is that so important in email marketing? Okay. Well, actually consent is much bigger than that. And I would call that permission. So permission-based marketing has been around for a while, for about 20 years Seth Godin wrote the book, Permission Marketing, and introduced us all to this new idea that marketing could be permission-based, and maybe we should only market to people who actually opted in. But consent is a little bit different in that consent has more parameters. So for one thing, in order for it to be consent, it has to be revocable. Let's say you tick a box and you say, yes, you can email me. You have to, at any time, be able to untick that box, turn the emails off. So that a lot of this is built into our email tools, like unsubscribe button. But let's say you're, you went to a trade show and you got like a list of all the other vendors that were there. We have two problems here. They never opted in. They did not consent. But also, they can't revoke yeah. consent. There is no unsubscribe because... You're not using, for one thing, like if you're not emailing from a proper system, there's just not going to be an unsubscribe button of the word. Whenever I talk about consent and consent-based marketing with women, they're like, they get it. Like women want more consent in their life and anything consent-based they tend to lean into. But, you know, sometimes when I talk about this with other business owners, they don't totally understand it. And what is important to know is like when you operate from a place of consent, like your relationships will be so much better. Like your customer relationships, those on the receiving end of your email are going to be so much more receptive. Think about how frustrating and annoying it is to have emails in your inbox that you didn't want, never signed up for and can't turn off versus the email where someone asked like, you know, this, this even works outside of email marketing. Like, let's say... Agel, I want to introduce you to someone reaching out and saying like, hey, Agel, may I make this introduction and getting consent first. And like when you get that introduction, you're like, oh, yes, I was expecting this. Tarzan asked if she could do this. You're just like so much more receptive to what the other person has to offer. That is a really good point. So I actually hadn't heard the the differentiation between permission versus consent. So thank you for clarifying that permission being a one-time yes, you can versus consent being mm-hmm. a what? like how- At the most basic level, and this is more like the way it's practiced in marketing, permission is a one-time ask. It's once you're on my email list, anything mm-hmm. goes. Consent is a lot deeper and more broad. So even if you think about the context of consent around the body, someone may say yes, but the difference between permission and consent is consent takes in the whole context. You can sometimes someone is saying yes, but when you take in the whole context, you realize that they're not actually saying yes. What are the circumstances around them saying yes? So consent is much broader and deeper and more meaningful. Consent has three qualities. It must be freely given. It must be informed and it must be revocable. Just let's just take ongoing and revocable. Like With email marketing, every email has an easy way to unsubscribe. And that way it can be revoked at any time. Therefore, the consent is ongoing. Informed is like when someone actually signs up, they know what they're consenting to. We've all been in like a sales funnel or an email marketing funnel where you gave your email, but then you got like a whole bunch of emails right away that you couldn't, you're like, hang on. I just wanted to hear from this person. I didn't want to sign up for this massive promotion. Even then, a lot of people use lead magnets to grow their email list. You can grow your email list with a discount code. All of those sorts of things work. And they also, they, they're also like have a lower level of consent. Again, consent is, it's a lot of different things. It doesn't just mean, oh, since someone like didn't tick a box, that means they didn't consent to be emailed. There are many different factors here. And lots of people do use giveaways and discount codes for, for e-com companies are like really important ways of getting customers and making conversions. So I'm not saying that's not consent-based. That's just like one part of the broader picture to think about when we're talking about consent. What I've learned from you is I love the way that when you have freebies and and downloads that get people onto your email list, there is an option to get the download and to subscribe or get the download and to not subscribe. And that 
is also another layer of consent that toy companies could be integrating if they are using things like coupon codes and discounts to get people onto their list, correct? Yeah. And so many like checkout, checkout page software, like any email software, like that's a very basic functionality, especially since there was this new rule introduced in 2018 that you may have heard of called GDPR. It applies to any subscribers you have from the UK, but it's just a little bit more, it's a little bit more strict. Like you need explicit permission to email Mm -hmm. someone. So like a lead magnet was, it was decided that's not good enough. So all of the email marketing tools have, you spend half an hour learning about it. You can set it up and it's just a tick box. You can just ask, here's my thing. Would you like to get my emails? Even on our checkout pages, 80% of people will say yes. That in the long term results in a much more high quality subscriber, like versus someone who just got on the email list without opting in. Those people might mark your email as spam, Mm -hmm. very bad for deliverability versus someone who actually opted in to be there and is reading the emails. They might hit reply and actually say something about your emails. All of those things like that they contribute to the health of your email list and whether or not your emails actually get delivered, whether or not they make it to like a primary inbox versus promotional inbox. It's really quite easy to build a huge email list of people that never really wanted the emails by bribing them with a discount code. In the toy industry, people listening, I get a lot of your emails and they tend to be very focused on, here's our product. We have this percent off. We'll be at this trade show shop here. But a lot of those emails that I get They're just emails where I've been added to a list because I'm attending a toy trade show or because I attended a media event and sometimes have indicated I don't want to be added to the mass list and still yet I'll get emails that I clearly know came from this event that I just registered for. So how could people properly obtain consent if they do go to a toy trade show And part of going to that trade show is the organization says, here's a massive list of people who are attending the show. What is the Hmm. right thing for them to do with those emails? Are you up for a toy challenge? Let's turn your idea into a prototype in just five weeks. Throughout the five weeks, we are going to analyze what toy companies are looking for, make sure that we understand the vibe of the companies we're pitching to, and we will inspire one another as we ideate and brainstorm concepts that answer what toy companies actually need right now. The Toy Challenge is a fast track to targeted toy invention, and you, my friend, are invited. Enrollment for the next Toy Challenge is now open. Visit learn.thetoycoach.com slash challenge to join today. What do you say? Are you up for a Toy Challenge? Okay, so the first thing I would do is ask, because you've just indicated an industry problem, which is that the event may be actually asking people whether or not they want the emails and not passing on that information. So first of all, ask the trade show, do they have data about who said yes to emails and who said no? There, you can decide what to do. Let's say they come back and they say, we don't have that data, no problem. You still have the list. So I would recommend two or three emails, send them from a proper email service provider, Ajal uses Active Campaign. I use ConvertKit. You have to send it from a place where people can unsubscribe. Mm-hmm. Two to three emails. This is who I am. This is why you're getting this email. We met at the trade show. Now I'm following up. Would you like to continue getting these emails? Then you have something for them to click. I would ask for explicit consent to be added to an email list. You can do it the other way. There's explicit consent and there's implied consent. Implied consent is if you don't click this link, I'll assume you want to keep getting these emails. That can work. Like every provider, every everybody's different. If you're if it's a large list of say a few thousand people, I would go for explicit consent. If it's a small number of people, less than a hundred, implied consent might be fine. You probably have a closer relationship with those people. So that's what I would do if you have no idea who wants to be who said they want to be emailed or doesn't want to be emailed. So just as a reminder, tell them who you are, tell them where they met you, and then ask, do you want the emails, yes or no? 
But toy trade shows have 3,000 manufacturer attendees. They might have 1,000 to 2,000 retail attendees. Likely you didn't meet everybody, but you still are getting... Oh, yeah, yeah. How do you word that in a way that is not off-putting to be like, hey, we didn't meet, but I know you went to the show, so that's how I have your information. (laughs) Perfect. Okay. So great question. One thing that applies to all emails is like, talk like a human. People want to hear from humans. They don't want to read emails from companies. So hi, I'm Ajal Wade. I was a whatever you were at the whatever it's called trade show in Chicago this August. This is the thing that I do. Would you like to be added to my email list? Yes. It's not necessarily like we met. It's more like, where did you come from? Yes. So let's say if you join my, there's so many different ways to get on my email Mm -hmm. list. There's like many different doorways, but let's say you send an email to your list and you say, Hey, you should all read Tarzan's emails. And then the confirmation email says, Oh, cool. You came through a referral. We don't know each other. So let me introduce myself. Right. Now the ramifications of not obtaining explicit consent or even implied consent from the toy industry's perspective can be a a ruin to your network. If you start overflowing my inbox with your Mm -hmm. emails, I'm not going to want to hear from you anymore. I'm going to hit unsubscribe. I'm not going to want to review pitches you Mm -hmm. might send me because your email address, your domain in my mind will be associated with a spamming of my inbox. But I'm curious, do you know anything Mm -hmm. about the legal ramifications? Are there any, have you ever heard of anyone falling into legal ramifications from not obtaining consent? Yeah, I actually haven't. Like technically you can get fined. Like even someone in the US or me, I'm in Canada. Like if you are violating GDPR regulations for your subscribers in the UK, like technically you can get fined. However, I've never heard of anyone getting fined Certainly not people like me who have an email list of 10, I I have 12,000 subscribers, but a lot of people and my colleagues have like a hundred thousand, even a few hundred thousand. I've never heard of any of them getting fined, even though many of them are breaking Mm -hmm. the rules. It doesn't look to me like regulators are going after small time operators like me. So I feel compelled to say this is a legal issue. In many cases, you must, even what you're talking about, that would not be can spam or castle compliant. Never mind GDPR, which is more strict. Can spam and castle, you need some sort of implied mm. consent. So that is definitely not legal. However, the more compelling reason to operate with consent is that your deliverability is better. You're not going to trash your network. You're going to actually be building subscribers, referrers, and customers. I'm sure people right now are like, I'm too busy to care about all that Tarzan and Nigel. I just want to upload this list, send it to as many people as possible and generate sales. So can we talk about open rates? Can we talk about email list size? Maybe you and I can share our numbers a little bit. So you have 12,000 subscribers, (laughs) right? What is your open rate? Uh, My average open rate right now, I believe is 42%. And the click-through rate? Oh, the click-through rate varies a lot. So the thing about the click-through rate is it takes in the data from every single email that's ever been sent, including sequences, including things that didn't have any link clicks. So I like to look at the click-through rate on my individual emails and even more specifically the click-to-open rate, which is the number of people who opened the email, how many of them clicked versus click-through rate, which takes into account the, all of the subscribers. Yeah. So a really good day, my click-through rate on a newsletter would probably be like 3%. Yeah, I think you taught me that. Active Campaign doesn't have click-to-open rate, so I have to calculate it. Mm. So mine has been mm. 2% for click-to-open, but my open rate was like 35 is the average. Okay. But here's the thing. So somebody listening that is just importing all the emails that they're getting likely is having an open rate, I would estimate 10%. And then the people Mm. that they're emailing me, I'm not a buyer. I'm not the person you want to be sending your wholesale prices to. You're paying to have me on your list and on your ESP. And I'm not even a potential customer. I want to frame it in people's minds of it's actually worth your time and effort to have 
the right subscribers on your list and to build a list of real potential customers who are engaged and want to hear from you and will open 35 to 40% of your emails and click to buy 3% of those rather than having a list of maybe you have a 50,000 person list, but if only five to 10% of that's getting opened and then even less is getting clicked through, is it really worth it? That's a great point. Another thing that's coming up as you're saying that is it sounds like for type of people that you are working with, knowing certain information about the subscribers is really important. Like those yeah. wholesale prices. And there's lots of tools that you can use to gather information about subscribers. Uh, and you could add this to your strategy after a trade show. Following up, ask people to opt in, but ask them some questions about themselves, like immediately after. So are they a wholesaler? Like who are, I don't know what the categories are, but there's, you know, it's, it's not that difficult to set that up so that every subscriber is tagged and you actually know who they are. So when it is time to send out wholesale prices, you're sending them to people who should get them and not people who shouldn't. So this opens up a whole other segment of conversation because the data that these shows share are already segmented. I am not listed as a retailer. But that is the level of laziness that companies are taking these lists, dumping them into their ESP, and just emailing everybody the same thing. Like what I could do if someone <laughs> just gave me a list and said like, this, these are the email addresses, here's their names, here's what type of business they have. Like, oh my God. You can just talk to people so much more specifically, like, the retailers need their own messaging. Like the retailers are on a calendar that's like totally different from like the manufacturers. And the more you can personalize your marketing, the more effective it is. Okay. How can we prove that? Is it really worth my effort? And how do I prove that it is? So if we're talking about just writing, you know, an ongoing a newsletter, like what's the company up to? Like you can speak more broadly about what the company is doing. That's interesting. What you're doing, um, you know that that's like the newsletter stuff. And there might be moments where you can put in some specific like content that's just for wholesalers. But when you're actually trying to sell something, in that case, of course it's worth it. I can say like. Okay, I, I'm I'm doing a promotion myself right now. I have my 12,000 email subscribers. Some of them get emails from me weekly. Some of them get emails from me monthly. And I'm doing a promotion that is only to 400 people. And those are the people who have indicated that they are interested in the thing that I'm selling. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's early to give you the numbers. And eventually I'll open that up into the a bigger part of my list. But like, I know from my history of being in business... It's more effective to just email the small segment of people who you know will be interested and talking to them directly rather than trying to talk to everyone, which is just like a common rule of marketing. Like if you're trying to talk to everyone, you're not talking to anyone. Like your sales like strategy has to be just like very watered down so that it applies to everyone. Whereas like, let's say you're talking to a wholesaler, like you can get more specific about like, the seat they're currently buying for, whatever it is. I have bought from brands physical products that do the type of email marketing that you do. That is like the storytelling mm -hmm. format. And then when promotion season comes, there's a promotion side. All of the emails that I get from toy companies are all promotion. And these are all the brands that are just putting me on their email list without me having registered. I have not gotten one that is, my name is... I started this company because our team is, I've not gotten one. Mm. They're literally all see you at New York toy fair. Have you registered time with us? Our next items are out. Check our wholesale guide, like every single one. I would love for you to talk about this email marketing conference that you just went to, because you said that major brands are now realizing the importance of having a person behind them that is telling them about their story and their beliefs. Could you talk a little bit about that we need to have a person behind the brand and we need to have a little bit more story in it. Yeah, well, I mean, let's just at the rise of influencer culture. Like so many companies now are paying influencers to be the face of their brand because people don't want to buy from companies. They want to buy from people. And they definitely don't want to read emails from companies. They want to read emails from people. 
So like in the, I was just at a newsletter conference recently and there were a lot of um, operators like Bloomberg and yeah. um, all like 1440, like news, news, newsy newsletters. And those news publications, like they're actively, go, like they want their journalists to have a public profile. Um, you know, even corporations, like they also will, they want their executives to have like a LinkedIn profile. Like, hmm. and if you want your marketing to be interesting and attention grabbing, like there needs to be some story behind it. We're just not invested in the success of companies as we are invested in the success of people. And the oh. other thing is we want to buy from people we like. Yeah. Like, how do I know if I, obviously I don't like Mattel. I Mattel made the Barbie movie to like humanize the company so that we could get behind like a person and a story. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's a really good point. So, okay. I'm looking at this, I have this email from a brand called Kinder Feeds. And it looks like, I think this is the introduction email. It opens with the logo, sustainably made internationally designed collections that supports a physical and cognitive child development. And then it goes into born in the Netherlands where love of biking is fostered at a young age. And it talks about the founder, Oscar V. Mulder, who was determined as a young parent to cultivate an appreciation for adventure in his son, but began as a one-time project to build his child a balanced bike quickly developed into a thriving children's company. All emails should come from a human. It doesn't have to be the CEO of the company. It doesn't have to be you. I mean, I wonder, like, does it even need to be a real person? But mm. it should come from a person because a person has a voice. I don't know who the person is. Like companies don't write emails. People write emails. So who is the person writing this email? I don't know yet. This like I do like that this person is trying to bring us into the brand story, though. Uh, born in the nether, a love of biking is fostered at a young age. The other thing, though, is like it sounds like a press release and one thing when it comes to storytelling, something that I just do naturally because I've told so many stories is I don't tell stories in a linear way. I use non-linear storytelling. So just, you know, we literally started at the beginning when Oscar V. Mulder was born. Like, I don't know who Oscar V. Mulder is. Like, I don't really care that much. However, the idea of like a five-year-old child, like biking in the Netherlands is like kind of cute and interesting. So, you know, we could be like when five-year-old Oscar like climbed onto his first bike in the city, you know, in the, in the damp streets of Denmark in 1948, like, you know, a few, a few things stuff up, but so like good. with like a few any details can see, taste, feel, touch, like, yes. you know, because damp, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, like the nostalgia of like a five-year-old, his first bike, like we want people to feel something. Um, and I did uh, put out a line that started at the beginning of the story, but you don't have to start at the beginning of the story. Usually the way we write stories is at the beginning and then to the end, which is fine. And that's a great way to draft an email. What you'll usually find is like the climax in the middle is a really good hook. Mm -hmm. So that could go at the top. Yep. Like I could be like before Kinder Feats was a billion dollar company. It was just five-year-old Oscar on his bike. Like, you know, we, we that's not a great example. Yeah. I don't think Kinder Feeds is a billion dollar company, but you see what I'm saying? Right. Drop the middle of the action rather than like telling them maybe the most important rule of email. Nobody cares. Okay. Like I'm in my inbox because I want to delete stuff. Like I'm trying to get to inbox zero. If you can like give me a reason to delete something, I'm going to. So emails need hooks. Like they need... That they need, on the other hand, we also all want to be entertained. How many times a day do you open your email or you open Instagram or whatever because you just want a hit of dopamine and you want to be distracted? Like, we can work with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to like pull people into something that's going to like stimulate my reward pathway. The, your process of the hook at the beginning has worked so well for me. I did one email about how my now husband, then boyfriend, and I had decided to go to Paris and Madrid for like a two week 
trip and I wrote out the whole story and I moved to the very top was I moved to Paris for a week or something along those mm. lines. And it worked so well <laughs> because it was like, wait, a toy coach moved to Paris? When did this happen? But it was totally. part of a larger story. And, and that's so brilliant because it just pulls people in to want to know more. It gives away a little fun nugget of, of the story and it makes it worth it to read the rest, right? Because you want to figure out what happened that week in Paris or what happened to that five-year-old boy on his bike in the damp world <laughs> of Denmark. So. What if somebody doesn't want to be the face? Have you ever seen someone use a character, a persona, or maybe even a team member as the face of their emails? Team member for sure. I haven't mm. actually seen a persona. I'm sure that happens and I just didn't know what was going on because if it is a persona, right. really the subscriber shouldn't know. But yeah, 100%, this could be a team member uh, for sure. Lots. I mean, lots of people in my industry do do that. In fact, it's almost not believable when it's like CEO and founder Tarzan K is writing you an email every week. Like, no, you're not. <laughs> yes, you <So> are. <laughs> I am. <laughs> right. But I don't have a, you know, I don't have, I'm not like at the helm of a big company. Fair. Okay. That's such great tips. One of the rules of social media is you don't sell. You give every once in a while you sell. And I feel like you teach a similar thing with email. Like you share, you teach, you offer suggestions and guidance, but you can't constantly be trying to sell your product or people aren't going to want to open that email. Is that true? I mean, the larger my list grows, the less I have to sell, the more I can sell things a little bit more passively. Um, but 95% nurture. Wow. Most of the emails. Yeah. I mostly only do nurture and then I sell things, you know, the promotional sections in my email at the top, there might be like a little, a text, a little box or something that says like, here, this thing's on sale. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm doing a major promotion, then yeah, I, I might send like 10 emails specifically about one offer, mm -hmm. but that's like a quarterly promotion. Most everything else is nurture. And, you know, I'm selling larger ticket offers. So, right. so that is important if you're selling higher price items or if you're selling in bulk. But, you know, if I'm like an e-com company, I would be constantly nurturing and my email list or my emails and newsletters would have like lots of offers throughout the email. Okay. Yeah. Because some people listening to this podcast, some are e-com where they're selling direct to consumers, but some are selling to retailers where they are selling larger amounts for seasonally. So it's just mm -hmm. a good thought that not every email has to push something if your plan is to get one larger order, you know, for Q4, or one for Q2, maybe you don't try to sell every single email. But as you said, if it is e com and you're selling direct to consumers, like you would throw those offers throughout. The other thing, nurturing is preparing people for the sale too. So you are looking for that larger bulk order. The months preceding it are like, oh, we're like working on this. We're like developing this new toy. We're like so excited about it. Oh my God, we got our first prototype. Oh, here's our first order. Like, oh my gosh, the box arrived. Like, here's the new toy. Like, you know, you're like people excited about the things that's coming so that when it's coming, it's not just like, oh, May 1st lands in my inbox because now it's sales season. It's like, no, oh, this thing that we've been talking about for months is like finally on sale and it's the season that I'm going to buy it. So I'm going to buy it. That is such a good point. So in the toy industry, everyone is very secretive about what they're developing. And usually mm. what happens is toy trade shows are times to do previews of items, but there are usually items that are super secretive. And then there's some items that they'll let a few people see. So you could definitely use your email to show, okay, here are some of our less secret items that were in development. And if you have an account with us, click here, log in, and we have a page to show you what's really coming down the pipe, what's in development. I think buyers would love that. I could see that being a valuable investment. Yeah. Another idea that I have yeah. you know, is like, okay, it's secretive. You let loose a few teasers, a few ideas of what's coming. And in order to like actually the big reveal of what's coming, you yeah. have to like give your name and email or like explicitly ask for more information. And then, I mean, buyers who actually raise their hand, who you know are interested and you can follow up with them. Or get them to reply to help your deliverability, right? Because sure. now getting them to reply is so important. Oh, those are great ideas. Okay. 
Yes. All right. Okay. Thanks, Tarzan. This was fantastic. We went from consent and then we got to dive in a little bit into the value of just email marketing in general. I know we have to close out, but before we do, I just want to hear what you think the future of email marketing will be. We have seen story-based emails that are almost like a letter from a friend. We're start- I'm starting to see more newsletter-focused emails. Where do you think that email marketing is going to be going? Is it going to be replaced by text marketing? <laughs> I mean, people have been saying that for a long time. I <laughs> mean, all things end. So surely it's coming to an end. However, you know, text message marketing works in some for some companies and it doesn't, there's just nothing like email. It's like our digital address. But what's important coming down the pipeline is even more controls on the user end. So if you as an email marketer are not thinking about consent-based marketing, Google's thinking about it. Yahoo's Mm. thinking about it and they're putting rules in place for deliverability so that it's more difficult to reach inboxes if you're not operating from a place of consent. So, you know, Google and Yahoo recently rolled out a lot of new rules for deliverability. So the stuff, the kind of stuff that you're talking about, Mm Ajal, it will get harder. Mm -hmm. A lot of those inboxes won't reach a lot of the people on that list. And not only that, but you will tank your own server reputation and you won't be able to email people. You know, Google just introduced a feature that they're apparently going to roll out where subscribers can change the frequency. Gmail will identify that someone's emailing you a lot and you get a box that says, I only want to hear from this company once a month. Wow. So they're not preemptively like work from a place of consent. And it's better for me, like I have frequency controls. So my subscribers can say they only want to hear from me once a month Mm -hmm. versus if they make that choice in Google, I have zero control Mm -hmm. over what Google is going to show them once a month. Like, but now I write a special email for my monthly list and I say like, Hey, these are the things that I have for sale coming up next month. This is what you missed last month in case you still want to buy it. Like these are the emails I sent. You can read any of them. That's just one example of why it's just like so much better to do this, to manage all that consent based stuff on your side rather than letting Google and Yahoo manage it for you because they will. Oh, I did not know that. It's really great for you and me, Ajal, because we are already using these consent-based strategies uh, and building a list in a different, you know, you, I'm, maybe you have opt-out boxes, maybe you don't. The list management strategies that you have learned from me have all of this covered. I'm thinking, oh, I should have a monthly option. That's what I'm thinking because Uh, I'm sure I wouldn't. I'm sure there's somebody who would say, oh, I would love a monthly email from the toy coach instead. And then if Google gives them that option, they'll just take it because it's easy. So I'm thinking from a user perspective, if I want something and the toy coach isn't offering it, but then suddenly Google says, let me do it. I would be like, oh, okay, that must work. You know what I mean? I think what's more important for you uh, and for people who may be thinking about this is to... Um, let people opt out of promotions because oh, yeah. if you're just emailing once a week, like your subscribers probably okay with that. Right. But having a higher volume of emails, that's when people are more likely to be like, oh my God, a gel again. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm turning her into monthly. Yeah. But again, this is an argument for like working with consent all along. So yeah. that if I'm sending a promotion and you can just click a link and turn the promotion off, you're not going to like roll because yeah. we already took care of that for you. That is true. Yeah. Uh, You're just bringing up one final point. I have to point out to people, if somebody unsubscribes from your list, your email service provider will mark them as unsubscribed, but you could manually override it and don't do that because I get so many people doing that to me. This course creator who I've definitely unsubscribed from and literally once a year they resubscribe me and send me emails. So uh, what I see happening with people in the toy industry, I unsubscribe from toy list, but then I go to another show and I think they get my email again and re-upload it. And I don't know if they had deleted it before. So now it looks like a new email. You really have to be careful that if somebody unsubscribes from your list, you don't just go resubscribing them without consent. 
and shows need to be a lot more careful about giving out these emails. Like, cause now I'm not trusting your show with my email. Actually, there are retail buyers who have told me they make new emails for shows mm. and give the shows that email. So you don't even have their real email. Tarzan, this was a great conversation. And I thank you so much for your insights. Where can people find out about you, Tarzan? Uh, well, you can get on my newsletter at emailsbutbetter.com. Emailsbutbetter.com. Sign up for my newsletter. That's the best place to hear from me. I'm on LinkedIn. So if you want to like hang out with me on social media, that's the only channel that I hang out on. And uh, my website, if you want to see my offers and stuff, is tarzank.com. And she is just the best email storytelling teacher ever. Thank you so much, Tarzan. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Well, there you have it, Toy People. I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I know your time is valuable and that there are a ton of podcasts out there. So it truly means the world to me that you tune into this one. Until next week, I'll see you later, Toy People. Thanks for listening to the Making It in the Toy Industry podcast with Ajel Wade. Head over to thetoycoach.com for more information, tips, and advice. Hey, are you an aspiring toy inventor or toy entrepreneur? Then you should check out Toy Creators Academy, the first of its kind online program designed to help you develop and pitch your toy ideas. Head over to toycreatorsacademy.com to learn more.